Wow. I thought today I would simply walk you through one of the largest, most complex underground bunkers in the world built by the German army during the Second World War. But when I got into the facts of it, there's so much more, so much more troubling than that. This is one of the largest bunkers in Europe. Four underground stories, two half floors additional, 400 rooms over 150 square feet built by the German Army's research unit and IG Farben, and of course the SS became involved. When I started looking into this, the story became very dark and took on a whole new dimension. Well, we're going to see the bunker, but now I have to tell you how close many of your grandparents came to not being here because of what took place here. The story here, however, appears straightforward on the surface but I'm afraid it's not that simple. So you have to now carefully follow the connections I'm going to present to you. But let's start from the beginning. In 1936, the German four-year plan was put in place, intended to reactivate German economy and industry, with a special focus placed on synthetic rubber and fuel, intending for Germany to become independent of foreign imports. Of course, also, the rocket program was sped up and Peenemünde, the large testing facility for rockets on the Baltics, was constructed. There was lots of money and goodwill. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute had begun its first research into a compound named Enstoff. Began initially envisaged as an explosive for rocket fuel, the central office for the development of production of weapons for the German army, too, had been researching into this highly reactive chemical compound ever since 1934. Chlorine trifluoride, CIF3. Now, in contrast to other equally reactive fluorine compounds, this had a favorable boiling point, which made it possible to handle it as a liquid instead of as a gas, an important prerequisite for use in practice. And Erich Schumann, head of the Heerenswaffedamt, whom I have introduced you to many times, head of the Army Research Department, was particularly enthusiastic about the properties of the end stuff. Schumann himself made presentations to the top generals and to Hitler himself with various demonstrations and experiments carried out before them. For example, some end stuff was poured into a metal tub that had been spread with fat which immediately ignited the fat and burned it off with small explosions. The sight of this experiment must have been impressive. Similar was the pouring of a small amount of it onto ordinary sandy soil, which also set that on fire. What this particularly impressive was, was pouring Enstoff onto water. It also caught fire. With these and other demonstrations and experiments, influential personalities, including Hitler himself, was influenced to such an extent that the order was given to develop useful manufacturing processes and to set up a manufacturing facility. So, in 1938, the army thus began to set up a large-scale production facility to produce end stuff, believing an application would be found for it later. So, in the forest near Falkenhagen was chosen a site. It was remote, 60 kilometers from Berlin. It had lakes from where water could be taken for cooling, and of course a rail link was already in place to the nearby town of Briesen. And Schumann's colleague, Siegfried Glube, with connections to the SS, was put in charge of setting it up. This was to be produced in an enormous underground bunker, with walls three and a half meters thick, and for some reason, an extremely complex bunker, as you will see, and for another reason, underground. A quick reminder, Schumann and the nuclear scientist Kurt Diebner would later team up to develop the first nuclear bomb, which they tested in 1945 in Jonasthal, along with SS General Kamla. And Diebner had his first reactor at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. By the way, Glube 
also had his origins at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and knew Diebner well. Just remember this piece of information. We'll come back to it. Not only was Enstuff to be built at Falkenhagen, but also other scientific institutes. A test field with blasting ranges, shooting ranges, as well as a vacuum tunnel in which the influence of air pressure on a bullet's flight would be examined. The complex allowed for storage, administration, workshops, housing for workers, several kitchens, a hospital, technical testing facilities, a heating plant, and energy distribution, of course. The site, however, had logistical problems. There was no way to evacuate the spill water, and electricity was also to become a problem. Now, usually, the German army did not build its own factories or produce munitions. They would use a cutout company, one named Monten, to front such endeavors. In fact, Monten was founded in 1916 by the army, and as a privately owned holding company, which would in turn own and run the various chemical and munitions factories for the army in collaboration with other private companies. They would partner up with companies such as IG Farben. Here, Schumann tried his very best to keep IG Farben out of the loop until forced later on for some reason. There were construction issues, as German rearmament and construction left some competition for resources, but eventually Hitler and Goering would throw their full weight behind supporting the project, and even the SS gave it a priority one classification. Now materials was one thing, but as the military called up more and more young men, labor increasingly became an issue, and the construction suffered from lack of everything, materials, fuel, Things could not be delivered as needed, and there were even calls for the project to be abandoned, as officially the use for end stuff had not yet been found years later. Now, let me paint you a picture. The German Reich spent an impressive amount of resources building a super bunker. IG Farben entered the picture around 1942, followed by the SS. Six years of construction, thousands of workers, over 50 tons of end stuff was produced, and at no point was an application ever identified for this. The army eventually did not want it. The Luftwaffe thought it would be too problematic to handle or use in the bombs. The navy thought maybe for torpedo fuel, but still no. The rocket scientist in Pienemünde also did not want it. Yet the SS wanted it, and they wanted to take over production of it. Schumann pushed it hard and Hitler never cancelled it. Why? And let me tell you just a few of the properties of Enstoff, or as it's today known, SIF. It is, of course, extremely toxic, but that's the least of the problems. Now, it will ignite violently with every known fuel, and it will react so rapidly that no ignition delay can even be measured. It will also react with such things as cloth, wood, oh, and test engines, of course, not to mention asbestos, sand, and glass. It will even ignite spent ashes, oh, and of course water, with which it will react explosively. Even with titanium, tungsten will not work, and it will corrode through gold, iridium, platinum as well. In one accident, it even burned through 30 centimeters of concrete and 90 centimeters of gravel beneath it. In fact, there is only one known fire suppression method, flooding the fire with nitrogen, or a noble gas such as argon, as it will react violently with water and CO2. And it will also ignite living tissue, just for good measure. You may now begin to understand why nobody stood in line to fill their warehouses with this stuff, right? Now, it can be kept in some of the ordinary structural metals, steel, copper, nickel, aluminum, if properly prepared and at room temperature. However, if not, the operator will then confront the problem of coping with a metal fluorine fire. And for dealing with that, the only recommendation still is really good running shoes. During the entire war, the Germans never found an application for Enstoff. And I will add to that, officially. 
Now, it was tested on fortifications, as it is extremely reactive with most inorganic and organic materials, and make many non-flammable materials ignite without any ignition source, sometimes explosively violently. I mean, who wouldn't want this? So, as it reacts violently with all organic materials, that also includes carbon filters, such as those installed in the ventilation system of bunkers during the Second World War to protect against gas attacks. Now, a promising possible application of the end stuff was the destruction of such filters. It had an application as an explosion. Detailed tests on Machinot Line forts in 1941 showed that their systems were put out of operation by destroying the filters using nitrogen and the resulting secondary effects Carbon oxide rose to concentrations well above lethal. Smoke would fill the service corridors and the extreme heat. It burns at 2400 degrees Celsius. A test was also carried out in 1942, clearly showing that even a defensive structure like the West Wall bunkers offered no protection against the effects of this substance. One of the standard works was put out of action within two minutes with a load of six kilograms. The effect was achieved by directly entering the end stuff into the air intake opening, using army pioneers for a close attack. The effect could not yet be achieved with artillery or bombs. However, only if applied in the correct way, and it was volatile to transport. However, in 1944, a 3-liter stuff pot was introduced to the army to combat combat filters and fortifications. However, it has not been recorded used. There was hoped it could be used as an additive to flamethrowers or torpedoes, but it proved extremely hard to harness. Schumann tried to encourage Pinamunda to test the end stuff in V2 rockets. However, he could not provide enough for the tests, nor any skilled engineers to handle it were provided. So Pinamunda based their negative evaluation on mathematical testing and rejected the end stuff as too dangerous, and it would not increase performance of the rockets either. So Schumann did not really seem too keen in selling this to the rocket scientists, if he couldn't even be bothered providing them with any. So all that being said, what's going on here? Maybe if I tell you what we are using and stuff for today, I may wake you up. The compound today is primarily of interest in plasmaless cleaning or etching operations in the semiconductor industry, in nuclear reactor fuel processing, which is the main use of CIF. It produces uranium hexafluoride, an inorganic compound with the formula UF. It is used in the process of enriching uranium. And Diebner and Schumann was working on a nuclear bomb with the SS. Do I have your attention yet? Good, because this is about to get a whole lot worse. There was an SS think tank, a small fraction within the SS, who had developed the idea of saturating a 130 kilometer wide belt with nerve gas right across Eastern Europe, a death zone where nothing would live in order to stop any Russian advance, and without the knowledge or approval of Hitler. Did Himmler know? Or later, did Kamla know? This may become really important later. In 1942, Herr of IG Farben Otto Ambrose held a lecture for Hitler and top leadership on the development of combat gases since World War I. It was clear that nobody during World War II except Churchill who wanted to use these gases. And in fact, Churchill ordered the use of these, but were talked out of it by the British Chief of Staff and RAF. Nobody would use these, fearing how their enemy would respond. But still, it thus had to be produced. And IG Farben had already developed, and for several years produced, taboon, nerve gas. But Ambrose introduced to Hitler a new substance, easier to manufacture than taboon, sarin gas, and five times as deadly. 
and Hitler and Speer were impressed, so it was now decided to have IG Farben take over Falkenhagen. And as the army had not yet had much luck with end stuff, Hitler ordered that the SS should take over testing of that. Speer wanted to hand over Falkenhagen to IG Farben, and the traditional German infighting began. However, the writing was now on the wall. But let's first take a look at this amazing bunker and go through it. Imagine 400 rooms all purpose built and each designed for a special function. Every curve, every hole in the wall, everything was planned in every detail. It is truly amazing. After the Second World War, the Russians sat on the bunker for a few years, then eventually they outfitted it as a Warsaw Pact command bunker, an obvious choice, and to make this work the Russians had to use the existing German structure and work within what was. But they added new blast doors, they installed offices with walls, and a command and control, etc. But all of that was removed in 1991. And I mean really removed. Usually the Russians would leave half of their stuff behind when they left, but not here. It was all top secret. In fact, the existence of the bunker have been above top secret for most of its existence. So it is a fascinating place. Let's take a look at it. It's a little bit rusty. That sounds like home. Watch your step. Well, you're climbing a uh, what World War II water tower reconstructed by the Russians. Uh, I know. It should be built in the best Kopstahl. I'm not so sure. It's, it looks Russian. And the water tower, I guess the Soviets did not use. This is where they kept the guard dogs afterwards so and there was a water tank up top there all right so this thing is interesting and what was interesting about this is there's a an exit from the bunker through which you can funnel fuel that is exposing or needed to be vented or on fire out through here. This is the ventilation entrance or exit. This is where gases, fires, fuels on fire would be vented out here and it would be running through a sprinkler of water to further subdue anything that could potentially turn into an explosive situation. This is connected, or at least it used to be connected, to the main bunker. The Russians sealed off that connection. since the SS had cleaned out all the machinery. This is the ventilation connection to the tower. So ideally, any flammables would be venting through this and up and out of the tower. See this hallway down there that's not actually made to be walked through, but we will anyway. I just, the cement looks like this was made yesterday. It's interesting, this little wall was made to build, to shield people from a potential flammable explosion, as you can see here. There'll be little armored glass through here.
I was like, this is not for walking, this is for the fuels, the ventilation to go go here. And there's actually a ladder up inside the tower. You can see up there. Don't know how to get up there, but there's there's no ladder down here. The hallway was clad in fire resistant material. When the Russians took it over, they severed the connection and used this part for a guard shack for the patrolling guards and probably painted over it. This is where you watch your head because this is not very tight. This connection leads down to the bunker's third floor, and as we go there, you will see why that's important. The Russians did, however, also funnel some of the communication cables up through this. This almost looked like a little bit of re redo from Russian times. There are mounts or something on the walls here. collapsed this simply for the reason they didn't need it because they were here for a long time until the mother 93 I'm thinking that might be post war you can invent anything flammable through here you're not gonna yeah that's post war never mind Could have been an access hatch to the outside. This is possibly some of that tile. I find it hard to believe the Russians would tile their floors for the guards. Of course, the forests are littered with debris from the past 75 years and buildings, most of this time have no idea what is. So the conversation about this place even existed, didn't begin until 99, when the post-war allies began to discover, try to piece together what was done here. And I don't think that's even entirely clear yet. This is a really thick, heavy building. There was always a problem in getting rid of the wastewater here. This was for sewage and sludge, neutralization of the spent end stuff or the byproducts thereof. They would be collected and cleaned as best as could in these vats here. What I'm wondering is, because the roof that was here was so thin that maybe whatever was in here could be considered explosive. And that's why there's no roof 
so that if there was an explosion in here, it would just blow a thin roof up in the air, guided by these very thick walls that clearly weren't going anywhere. So the trains would come by here. This looks like a little rail. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could also be for trucks, of course, but... Oh, there's a little bunker oven. This looks sort of like a... It's not very deep, but... Pump water station. Or maybe a water treatment. Doesn't look like water treatment, sewage. One may wonder what the waste products of such a volatile compound may contain and how dangerous they could be in themselves. There are three extremely large and heavily reinforced ventilation towers connected to the bunker besides the blast tower. The Russians also sealed these off with blast proof doors and connected an emergency entrance or exit from the fourth ground floor. It's kind of funny. It looks so heavily constructed. It almost looks like it's a bunker. Oh, am I getting a new picture? Yeah. Wait, this door is Russian. This is a Russian door. Steel door. Oh yes, the Russians were using this as a headquarters. So that makes sense. That explains why that is a Russian blast door. And the, power. And the dog. And I would imagine that the bunker here was from the time of the war. It's not like you're gonna throw that up. And this thing is another ventilation tower for the bunker. This is huge. And you may as well get used to the term huge. It will be used again and again here. It is an enormous complex. But all of this was built by the Germans. The Russians just utilized it after the war as it was. That's a, a real thing. That's a real serious ventilation thing. And later I found out the hard way that despite the three towers still being connected even to the ground floors, without the machinery to pump clean air in. Well, they don't have much of a function, but they do look pretty. It's locked. Ah, it's the guy. So this is an alternative, this is the emergency exit. Uh, the sewers. The sewers? Yeah. Well, so it is an emergency exit. <laughs> <laughs> This is sort of where the story begins, not where it ends. This is the entrance to one of the largest bunkers or the largest underground bunker facilities built in Germany during the Second World War. 400 rooms, four underground levels after the war taken over by the Russians without them having any idea what the Germans were doing here. That makes this very interesting. We're entering the top floor, which is generally a utility floor. During the time of Second World War, there was train tracks running through here. It was still ABC proof back then with huge blast doors. The Russians turned the rail connection into two entrances, one at either end. One with airlocks and the other one for daily entrance. The Russian front door. you're going to experience this bunker just like I did for the first time trying to figure it out and along the way I'll try to explain to you what things are if I know. I don't know if I want to go up or I want to go down. What do you think? What do you want? Do you think these tiles are Russian or are they no, they're German. from the factory aren't yeah. they? But the Russians must have continued it when they...
I just love exploring with you when I have a Geiger counter. I can always hear the clicking. It's yeah. like, it's it, like, it, it picks some radon, I guess. It does? Yeah. Oh, good. It's running faster than our center. That's what I thought. That's what I'm like. I, I knew I was getting a twitch for a reason. Or it's uh, K40 in the cement here. Alright. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of strange. This tile. I mean, I know the factory had tile, but the Russians must have continued this. She's climbing up on the second floor, this Russian. So, now, we're going to have a look at this enormous place, built by the SS, taken over by the Russians after the war for a long time, and kept a secret for so many decades. Now, the Russians were using this as a headquarters. There would have been all these chemical airlocks. And then once, see the red button for the shower. Poison chemical. And everything was over pressure, of course. So chemical gases and nuclear couldn't get in here. So this is a post-war Russian construction. Our soldiers would come through here if they had been exposed, take their clothes off, get cleaned up, take a shower, wash off any chemical radiation dust before they could be allowed inside so they wouldn't bring any contaminants with them inside the complex. Very standard. And the interesting thing is this is even World War II adjacent certainly. The National Line Forts had chemical cleaning rooms. Expecting that war to be fought with gas. Fortunately, it wasn't, which is a an interesting component to Hitler's psychological makeup. Is he did not want to do chemical warfare. And related to ent entering the bunker and getting cleaned up and sanitized. This had nothing to do with the practical use of it. I think this is all it is. Yeah. yeah, this is all sanitizing.
So this, I'm taking it, will be the entrance of the actual bunker. The last thing you sort of expect to see coming out of there is like a dog. Like, whoa. <laughs> no, no, it's, I love it. I, it. It gives a complete, it gives environment, as we would say in the army. So here's the next. So this is the actual entrance. Well, okay. I don't even know what start is on. But I did mention there's four floors here, didn't I? I don't know if I mentioned it, but there is, so go with it. You may notice that after all this time of walking, only now are we actually in the production hall on the first floor. Control room up there. All right, I see where this is going. I guess we should be going up there, shouldn't we? That's how you get to go first. <laughs> oh, okay. This uh, is twice as high steps. There's nothing here. This is the room. There's one room. With no windows. However, if this was a light, well, somebody was doing something here. This is DDR time. And see, these are the times where I like to have a flashlight. Because, maybe, I can do this. I'll give you an idea. Ah, thank you. I love how I'm talking to my flashlight. Maybe it's the radiation. This is an interesting little walk. I gotta remember, these bones were made for the chemical production factory. Holy shit. What's there? A lot of space. Just saying, a lot of room. Remember, we have 400 rooms. Wow. <laughs> right? So this was the production hall for the catalytic synthesis for chlorine fluoride, the Ren stuff. Or the first floor was, as you will shortly see, it's rather large. So this is going to go... Ooh. Ventilation related. I'm going to have a tired camera hand at the end of this thing. I'm thinking. Look at this room. Look at these steel beams reinforcing the walls.
it's almost as if that those these are still yeah these are steel beams as it also almost as if they're supporting the walls of this room and there is a special way into this room very cute little staircase oh fuel tanks I knew there was something I knew there was a reason why that was yeah I can smell the fuel this is exactly what that was a straightforward fuel tank built by the Russians in a reinforced encapsulated building I wonder what that says about the roof I mean if it was going to go, it was going to go so we're still on the first floor of the support so this is all the support infrastructure what the Russians did here is fairly straightforward oh sorry <laughs> Holy. Do we have a map over this place? I think we sort of need some sort of a... And this is only one floor. floor. I know. Again. Can you read what that says? Can you read that sign? Can you read that sign? Figure it says something like fuel or danger, don't do this, high voltage, something like that. That's the Russians used the first floor here for transformer rooms, electricity production, with several backups. The average power here for the Russian time was 4 megawatts. Also, the whole bunker was under overpressure and chemical proof, of course. This just does not end. I need to start pacing myself. We have 400 rooms, and I'm expecting to die of old age in how long? This would have been offices, maybe, maybe the canteen. You're going to have to forgive a certain amount of guesswork because nobody knows exactly what was here during the war and even less when the Russians were here. I don't know if the Russians continued using the German type pneumatic pipes, cafeteria. This is a very, very cold room. Almost looked like an emergency exit. This is in... Now this is going to be a long video. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And what I want you to take away from this is the SS managed in secrecy to build it and keep it a secret for, well, practically the, until the late 90s. The Allies had no idea this was here. The Russians had no idea what they stumbled onto, and by the time they got the Russians came here, the Germans had dismantled everything already. So there was nothing here to indicate what this was. It took a long time after the Cold War had ended before people started piecing together the entire story, the full scope of this. Where every room was purpose-built, this could possibly be one of those production halls. This is just amazing. It, I, I, I am...
Okay. I think you'll recognize the bathroom when I uh, see it. I don't think we need a close up of the bathrooms. I'm just dying to go downstairs on the ground. This, this is still basically the upper level support part of the building. Now we're coming closer to. What are we coming close to? The rail tunnel here, back during the war, was 174 meters long. The Russians sealed it up to make blast-proof, gas-proof entrances. Yeah. And you would go through all of these locks. So I don't know what this is. It looks different. It looks different than the other entrance. There's no... I guessed correct. This is where the soldiers' materials and fuels would come in on a daily basis. While well, the other was only the chemical entrance for emergencies. There's another entrance down there. And I, th I think this was the everyday entrance. Ah, oh, look at this. Seriously? Truly? I don't hear any Geiger counter. Is that bad? <laughs> this all looks like offices. I hear people and dogs. Uh, 
possibly tritium paint. Or purple fluorescent. This is one of the original German signs from the time of the war that says the maximum pressure per square meter is 2400 kilos. And this, this is probably an access to the ventilation shaft. It would be. That really lit up the whole room, didn't it? So we're probably underneath the large ventilation tower now. That does not exactly tell me how we get down. I guess you can't read this either. What do you think it says? What? Is, uh, exit? Exit. Exit? This was uh, what generator room and power power supply ventilation room something some sort of technical machine stood there and no no I didn't this was probably a generator room I don't know why there would be anything radioactive about it. Fluorescent paint also gives off. And as you have all by now figured out, we're looking for the staircase down. Of course it's got to be this way. Bathrooms. It's not in here?
and it was in there. Yeah. Did oh, you found it? Okay, let me just see what's in here. I'm curious. Ten seconds. Oh, here's another staircase. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course it is. It's behind me. <laughs> That's there. I mean, of course there's a staircase. There's an arrow pointing this way, but there's also a staircase going up. Yes. Oh, I think that's just this. That was the roof, I think. Ventilation system, I think. Yeah, I think there's a ventilation sitting above the staircase. That makes sense. So down here. Well, there's always a staircase. Mm -hmm. Although, so there are two staircases like this, and that's what gives me the idea that. This is a staircase where workers would go down to work in underground labs, what have you. This is not a staircase where you bring production material up and down, and I haven't seen the lift. So, second floor. So, second underground floor. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> We're back to, I don't know where to start. This is interesting. Well, they walk this way. The floors are raised. Okay. This was the operational headquarters, the command and control. There was at any given moment 350 soldiers here, and the officer on duty was not allowed to leave this floor until his shift ended. Thus he had his own bathroom, as we'll see Large later. Space. This is steel, isn't it? This is not wood. No, it's just, no, this is wood. This was originally an end stuff processing optimization area. We're on a raised floor again. This situation room was constructed by the Russians inside the old German chamber. This floor would house most of the computers, the communication equipment, cabling, so on and so forth. Also, the whole bunker was EMP proof. There's a lot of attachments that used to be hanging on these ceilings and walls. This is full of, well, this one don't even know. But the bones, again, are German. 
the duty officer could be stuck here for weeks or a month on duty without actually being able to leave this floor. That's why he got a little extra creature comforts. More offices. Okay, now we're getting into the, the work areas. That's interesting, this is the end of the hallway. That means maybe there's two completely separate undergrounds if we can't meet the other guys down here. And they went down the other staircase. The other staircase? The German factory had extremely specific ventilation needs. Those for the Russian headquarters after the war was quite different, but you can still see the Germans' bones of what they had in some places. This means the other guys are downstairs in another separate place. Mm -hmm. Well, ain't that interesting? staircase like this was one of the things Ambrose was complaining about being too elaborate. So he said something about the third floor. There is something that was a little complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the third floor, is it? it's sort of the... I think it's the second. Two, the second and a half floor. A second and a half floor. Are you kidding me? second and a half and third floors were used for storage and ventilation and other things without being too specific. The third is a very specific floor. The Russians couldn't find much use for it because it was so specifically designed. Okie dokie. Well, I'm guessing this is... Holy shit. Look at this oil tank. Two, three. Wow. I mean, I don't even think this was oil because I don't smell any oil or gasoline. And usually with oil tanks, there's the smell. These actually were fuel tanks for the generators. And these are huge. This gives you an idea how far down deep we're going. And I will say these are the largest fuel tanks for any indoor installation I have ever seen. Wow. 
Oh, you can go. Oh, you can go down too. <laughs> so, second and a half floor. Where's that? And I think we should all start a fundraiser and get Paul enough money to work on doing a 3D sketch of this. It'll probably take him a few years. This sort of continues. Now the Russian shoes, did I get it? I think that's a part of the original design and I don't think it's a shelf for romantic candles. This doesn't end. When I say the biggest bunker in Germany, I should give you some idea. You okay? Steps. Above ground, there was one of the buildings that had a basement where the heating was created that was funneled into the bunker here, so the temperature was constant at the time of the war. How did they manage to build this thing? Technical? During the production, the entire bunker's temperature was between 20 and 22 degrees including the machinery and equipment. Everything was kept at a constant temperature, except for those parts that needed to be cooler or warmer. All of this is technical. I don't know if I'm still on the second and a half floor, or this is considered the third floor now. I actually don't know. There's a lot of these rooms with this cement shelf. And there really was a place where you could get lost. 
This certainly would be it. Funny how strong we reinforced and built this is, even underground. So that was a piece of machinery that ran pipes. In there. The amount of technical attachments and tunnels and subfloors, this floor must have been full of technical equipment and machinery. This was, if I was going to go with anything, this is the machine floor where all the technical machinery to a large extent was placed. This is still the second and a half floor that's barely counted. This is the staircase that was closed off for some reason. Are you upstairs or downstairs? Are you down here? So what's in there then? Is that the third floor? And despite there only being one staircase, we still all managed to get lost from each other. I'm going all the way down. Because, well, I'm on the fourth floor. I'm on the fourth floor. You guys? So you're all hiding down here. There's a technical floor on the second and a half. There's a two and a half floor as well. Well fine, just pretend you knew. <laughs> The fourth floor is a storage and bottling of end stuff and it has a very interesting connection to the third floor and the fire suppression methods that we're going to look into more closely. This looks like the original World War II, but... The Russians used this part for additional sleeping quarters during larger maneuvers. There's a floor one and a half above me here, or a half floor above me that was fenced off somewhat. And look at this wall. All these technical attachments. Now remember, this made a very special mix of fuel for the V2 that burned so hot it could almost melt stone. And that's not all. It only weighed half as much as the regular. Well, it flew on liquid oxygen, uh, hydrogen, right? This was lighter. So if it was lighter, that should give the rocket more range.
Oh my god, this is big. I do find it interesting that the final product, the most dangerous substance, is stored on the very bottom floor. And I still have failed to find a lift or an elevator, although there was a lift, supposedly, to bring this dangerous compound up and out. The impressive part is, how did they build this? Well, theoretically, I'm imagining they dug a very deep hole in the ground, just built it up. And we are quite far towards the east. We are still in Germany, of course, but we are in what would be central port, which means it will be fairly safe from overflights. And as they could have done it in secrecy. But this is certainly big enough to work. This is generally what you could see would be a production floor, almost. Isn't that ventilation overhead everywhere? So where did they come in? Have you seen their staircase? We that, that one? No, the one they came down. Oh, no. What the hell is this? I, th I thought you were behind me on the second floor. Wow. Yeah, it looks great. You, when you went down the stairs, did you look behind that other thing that was fenced off? No. So I guess we have to go up and look at that floor, don't we? Ah, okay. Well, I mean, just because it's fenced off doesn't mean you can't go in there. <laughs> I mean, 100, so, 151. So these are all just... It smells a little burnt in here. Maybe the room. No, this is this was all part of. Uh, I, I wonder if how many people were here. Have you seen any other toilets than that one? There's quite a few toilets, and a, and a two uh, tunnels in parallel, right? Yeah. This is the right one. And then the left one. Yeah. So it looks more Russian than German. Well, it looks like German building. I mean, there's two ways, either, I mean, the Russians used it after, but I don't think the Russians built this. I think the bones were, the bones were the old German. Concrete. Yeah. I mean, so that means the original structure is what we really have to look at is the, the bones of the building. So we have the two parallel tunnels with the small rooms. Why would you need that to make rocket fuel? I mean, you need you need what you need to make rocket fuel. You don't need. It's for living here, right? It is now, yeah. It's not for producing. Or offices, or I mean, the, the, the Russians used it as a as a as a bunker, as a command bunker after the war. They rebuilt all this so it would work for them. But the bones are still the same as the Germans built. So what did they do with it? I mean, what are the bones good for?
big heavy part. This is so thick. Can you imagine a big wall, door through here. Look how thick this wall is. Now, as soon as of course, there's a thick door that swung out. This is a ventilation pillar. And then what here's the other chamber that has similar buildings, similar rooms, roughly. And I say that. as in the room number. I'll give you an idea what we're looking at. 168. Let's see what's in there. There's just rooms. I could see you could have an office or whatever you had in here. Have a little, have a little ventilation access. But during the war, what was here? What did the German build? I mean, Again, so here's another room like this. The way I look at it is you make synthetic fuel, fuels, rocket fuel. Why do you need a whole row of identical rooms? This was not built like a bunker. This was not built like a... Well, I guess it was. It is built sort of like a bunker, but in one big square block, not tunneling. They must have dug down, built a huge hole, and started building it up, like they did with the blockhouse and others. Again. So, das sind dann andere Treppen, die diesen anderen Seite? Da war eine andere Treppe da, wo ihr reinkam. Okay, das sind eine. At this time, I was still under the pressure that there are two identical stairwells. One at the top is the dinner time. Where? This is the stairs. This is the bottom of the water. Is it the water tank? Is it the water tank? You have seen three big tanks, right? Yeah, this is this is the bottom from one of the tanks. Yeah. Was that water? Yeah. That's what I thought. Man, man, can't even see it. It doesn't smell of anything. Or, no, wait a minute. Remember, everything is purpose-built for a specific reason, and it is noted in what we do know that on the fourth floor here, there was also a fabrication hall. And then there's another walkway. And another huge tunnel. I don't even know where to start. 
if you ask me, I would be guessing that in here besides me is the foundation or the bottom of the water tanks. But I remember when we came up, when we were upstairs, they were to the other side. Hey guys! notes as to what this area was used for, not then, not by the Russians, but there is a slight chemical smell in the air, which stands still. I mean, I feel the water tanks should be in here. I'm also feeling like I'm walking on very shady metal. Technical something. I said technical something. I have no better suggestion. in the bunker underground. That's somewhat terrifying. Sounds like a really bad idea. So it just sounds like a really bad idea. None of this, it doesn't. I don't at this moment have any reason to doubt that's what they did. It just sounds wrong somehow. And I do want you to think about this. This was planned and laid out in 1938, way before Allied air raids even became a thing over Germany. So why would you build a huge, important, expensive and dangerous chemical plant in a huge bunker underground that had never been done before? So why do it? I mean, what else? This is this huge square something. There's a door into it. At this point, I'm starting to realize that my heart rate has gone up. I have a slight headache, and I'm getting a little bit lightheaded. I will also say one thing else. I tell you that I do feel a little lightheaded. Faster. I guess I'll make it out. I guess the 
touch here. As I can feel, the air in here is a little iffy. So, I hope you forgive me for just hauling, getting out of here. Yeah, okay, that sign's nice to see, but it's turning the wrong way. actually incorporate half floors, well, you're looking at a lot more than four floors. So you theoretically you're looking at six if you incorporate the two half floors. See, this is a half floor. silly shaking moving the camera as much but there was that bottom floor in the back I didn't smell anything it just seemed like bad air got a little lighthearted lighthearted <laughs> well constantly lighthearted got a little Headed and the rapid pulse. Nothing biting in my throat or vomit or anything. No smell. Just, you know, sometimes the air stands still for so long in a place, especially that place was way in the back. I don't think there was any more access to 
any kind of airflow. And this was just a reminder and a word of warning that even when you have your entire team with you, I still managed to wander away and into a dark corner of an enormous bunker and into some really bad air or whatever it was. I picked up on it and I left, got out, got some fresh air. But of course, we're going back under to look closer at these floors and the inner workings. And of course, the sarin plant. But I don't understand so many things about what happened here yet. Why did Schumann not want to involve IG Farben earlier on? They were experts and trusted by everybody. Even when it was clear the army needed a partner, they reached out to Rydell de Haan, Kimi, not IG. But Ambrose had Hitler and Speer's ear, so the partnership went to them. And the managing entities were merged, and Montan and IG set up one company, Turon, to manage and run the facility, with Ambrose as its managing director. The SS was involved from 1940, having provided the labor to the facility, but they wanted more. But initially, it was established as a joint venture between the army and IG, to produce and stuff and now sarin gas. Hitler wanted to hand over the testing of the end stuff to the SS, who went one step further and tried in a gamble to take over the entire facility, as Dr. Siegfried Klube claimed to the Farben managers on site when he showed up with a couple of SS men. Ambrose complained to Speer and Himmler had to relent, but the SS took over the sarin facility construction and was planning to produce 500 tons every month. The first sarin gas in Germany was produced at a plant in Raubenkammer, in a pilot plant disguised as a large farmhouse, but reinforced with steel and cement underneath. Here sarin and taboon was also tested further on animals. And throughout the war, over 500 kilos was produced here. One more sarin plant was being constructed at Dürnfurt, planning to produce 100 tons a month. By 1944, 60 million Reichmark have been spent on the Sarin plant and more on the Endstuff bunker. This was the most modern and impressive chemical factory in the world. And yet, when the IG executives first arrived on the site, they were not impressed. The buildings were not suited and had to be rebuilt, and Ambrose thought too much time and expense had been spent on elaborate details that were not needed. German engineering at its best, of course, overbuilt. Still, by 1944, the Enstuff plant was operational, and Ambrose would later explain that the SS had been approved for an underground sarin factory. Now, since the war, a vast array of people have worked very hard to prove that the sarin plant never came to production, and any statements to the contrary have just been dismissed. The problem is, we really don't know the SS destroyed all paperwork. We do know that over 12 tons of taboon was produced and filled into some 770,000 shells and 12,500 drop bombs. Of course also tons of mustard gas and phosgenes were produced, but sarin was five times more deadly than all of them. Yet the end stuff remains a priority despite all its shortcomings and lack of application, officially. Now, had somebody found a way to harness this extremely volatile, highly explosive compound, or had somebody else skipped ahead and realized its application for uranium enrichment? Ambrose had, during his meetings with Hitler, described Sarin as a weapon of last resort. And by 1945, January, that was not far off. The Russians were on the order. Evacuation of the factories began. In February, 60 freight cars with chemical equipment and machinery were sent to Stalin. Also, five tanker trucks were sent there. They were claimed to be empty, but only four arrived. The fifth went to Prague. And if you have been paying attention to the series, you will remember all roads at that time led to Prague. At a time where death would come quickly from the skies at the hands of the Russian or Allied Air Force, why would anybody pack up tanker trucks that were empty and drive them around sending them anywhere wasting fuel? Anyway, the SS packed up all the sarin equipment on the site and it was sanitized so no hint could tell the Russians what was done here. 
That is one reason why we don't have any proof if the SS actually managed to prove Saren or not. But it gets better. The director of Falkenhagen was Dr. Glube. He stated after the war, before the Russians arrived on site, mid-April, an American team arrived and removed all the documents which remained. Now this at a time where the Alsos teams were still crawling around Diebnow's reactor in Stadilm. How did an American team manage to cross the front line, cross Germany, and into an SS special project site and just pick up secret documents in a site covered and protected by the SS still, and later used by the German army for a base? Unless a deal was done and somebody in the SS, somebody high up, made a deal. The equipment for the Saren would eventually be handed over to the Allies. This is one of the large workshops, or maintenance halls, the Russians used this after the war for vehicle repair. During the war, underneath this is where the heating central was that would provide heating for the bunker next to it underneath. This is the rail station. Yeah, one. Oh, one. Yeah, one of them. So this is where the freight would be loaded and unloaded. No, not 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 so few. No, the fr the freight. I mean supplies and. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. The remnants of the DDR time buildings you still see and you recognize how that the stones are put on top of each other. So this was only one of these rail, rail receiving buildings. Yeah, the big where the, the weapons are and the dog. That's the big one. Yeah, I was wondering where that goes. But Yeah, I saw that too. That's, a, That's the the under end. Entry from the bunker. Amazing how big this all is. I knew he came down there. This was the lab facility. Holy shit, that is... That is Russian time, isn't it? The round one? It is. That The round one is Russian time. Well... So here... appeared to be... a connection... This is a little interesting I do. This is a manned axis. I wonder if the Russians built more buildings than the Germans built above ground. This is actually fun. This is this is got the little disguise like if it's a little barn. So you don't actually see that this is where the bunker is. Maybe loading bridge, maybe security. My thoughts are that the people that came in here were the workers. This was the daily entrance. Um, also because there's a staircase that leads up to the, the main building. 
that will then lead into the bunker entrance. And this one, I mean, there's one open, there's one closed. And they put this little flimsy hut on the outside of it. So anybody would be fooled, they think it's just another little shed. Plus, it's doubtful. It's probably the check in here. It's doubtful that the Allies knew the extent of this bunker. This was probably the access control. Yeah, there's little wooden floors in here. This little office. And this building right outside the bunker is where the Germans, the scientists, had made the first sample of sarin that was to be produced further away. This would have been an exceptionally significant development in the war that would have made it so much worse if that's... It's hard to say that World War II was bad but could have been worse. This would have made it worse. A lot worse. This is not just a flimsy building. Why is there one entrance to a room like this? And then there's many more. the only thing left that seems like an actual access. No. This is actually strange. There's just a few very heavily reinforced rooms with no access to it. Except this door. I mean, it would have been a secure lab, no windows, have offices, paperwork, and what have you upstairs. Maybe this is a small power plant. The Russians had some electricity in here after, from what it seems. nondescript little barn. People, they really don't <laughs> realize what is hiding underground and inside. The forests. And here you see the little building connecting to the bunker. I'm almost imagining the final days of the war was chaos, so let me paint you a picture of the last days 
and I will insert some of my own speculations based on having looked over the events and the maps. There was infighting in the SS. Himmler had tried to kill Kamler, or at least he thought it was Himmler. Kamler had no illusions about the war, or Hitler, or Himmler. He was now paving out his own plan, destroying everything before the Russians, and ordering his people to hand over everything to the Americans intact. That was violating Hitler's orders directly. Doa Mittelbau, the rocket scientist, Bergkristall, he even broke Dornberger out of prison after Himmler had put him there, possibly as a bargaining chip. So now, what happened to all the taboon shells and the end stuff, or perhaps the sarin? Several train cars made it across Germany, loaded with shells filled with taboon, completely insanely rolling these through German towns, subjected to constant air raids. At Lusa, the train was damaged in one, several people died from exposure. Now, Hitler ordered all of these special green ring shells and bombs to be blown up and destroyed. These had been placed in several stores around Germany and Austria. In one case, one brave German major tasked with blowing up a huge munition store near a large populated city, but he refused. Threatened with death by the local Gauleiter, he handed it over to the French. But there was a real danger that some of these stores might actually be blown up by some Sellers Gauleiter or SS officer, killing a huge amount of people. 612,000 taboon-filled shells were sent to St. Georgen, Austria, right next to Kamla's cement plant in Ebensee. That's just up from Kamla's quartz B9. That's just up from Bergkristall. And Kamla had just sent his entire family and the rocket scientists to the area of Ebensee. He would have known the danger, and he was seen in the area. It was eventually turned over intact to the Americans, along with Bergkristall and B9. But Kamla also headed to Prague, where the Enstuff truck had gone. Why? He was suggested also heading to the Richard Mine, just across the mountains from the Riese sites. Something appears to have been hidden in the depth there. Today we might never know. It's closed off as a nuclear waste storage site. But what if Kamla had come across the plan by the SS think tank to use Sarin or Taboon in one last desperate act? He would never have been able to close a deal with the Allies if such came to pass had members of the SS built a stockpile of nerve gas somewhere. Remember what Thomas Urich told us about what happened at the Project Riese sites years later. In the 90s, there was a plan to build a new oxygen in the area of Czerny and Świebodzic. What is interesting in this area, because my mom worked in telecommunication, had access to the documentation of this investment, so I saw it there part of it. But what is interesting to me then was that technologie do budowy tej oczyszczalni za czasów żelaznej kurtyny mieli dostarczyć Amerykanie. Miała być współpraca polsko-amerykańska przy budowie tej oczyszczalni i dodatkowo wiąże się z tym temat budowy koksowni w Cierniach. Nie w Wałbrzychu, gdzie były kopalnie, tylko koksownia miała powstać niedaleko tej oczyszczalni. I co ciekawe, że tam także miała być amerykańska technologia, i komory, gdzie by miano wypalać koks, miały być komorami zamkniętymi, w cyklu zamkniętym. To była bardzo, bardzo nowoczesna technologia na tamte czasy. A, ale czym się ona cechowała i dlaczego jest tu w tym momencie taka istotna? Dlatego, że w takich komorach można było spalać chemikalia, e, oprócz wytwarzania koksu, a także likwidować gazy bojowe. Spalać w tych komorach podczas wypału koś, koksu gazy bojowe. Dlaczego taką inwestycję lokowano pod Wałbrzychem, gdzie miano likwidować gazy bojowe? Na pewno by ich nie dowożono z nadmorza, bo taka inwestycja powstałaby nad Morzem Bałtyckim, czyli gdzieś te gazy bojowe muszą być tutaj niedaleko składowane, bo taki obiekt musiał powstać do, blisko tego miejsca, gdzie są składowiska właśnie gazów bojowych. What chemical agents did the Poles need to destroy years after the war in that neighborhood? So important that despite the Cold War, the Americans willingly supplied the machinery to do it. Was it sarin? Was it end stuff used for enrichment? I'm speculating here. Joseph believes there is more to end stuff, and we certainly cannot rule out this could be used as an explosive agent as well. But it seems extremely odd, even for the Germans, to expend 
so many resources to produce something they apparently had no use for, and I'm starting to think that they did not. In the next episode, here, we are going to the sarin plant right next to the bunker, and also we'll try to explain how the end stuff was produced and some of the security measures here. Stay tuned. Ah, come here. Take a look, I knew it was something. I don't know what it is, but I knew it was something. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.